how to drive an entire industry out of business. Ladies and gentlemen, I know a lot of these talks that uh, convince you to do something for progress and something for development have a lot to do with creating things. But let's get aggressive for a moment. And I'm going to use the time that has been given to me to talk to you about how you drive an entire industry out of business and one in particular. The industry that I'm talking about is a massive global enterprise, employs thousands of people around the world, uh, is run by both multinationals and national operations, by several startups, in fact. It's worth hundreds of billions in US dollars. And the only product that it manufactures is death. So what is this industry that I'm talking about? The industry of war. And I, w I use war more as a literary device here. What I'm talking about it really is armed conflict. Armed conflict between groups, between states and groups, between groups and society, between any two groups of people who use war and armed conflict as a means to gain either economic power, more territory, political power, um, and all of those things. Just to give you, a, and this is not a set of isolated events around the world. This is, in fact, a global enterprise of such a large scale. Just to give you a sense of how big this industry is, let's take a look at some of these numbers. Um, very interesting. 1,765 billion US dollars is annually what is spent on military expenditures around the world by states and non-state actors. 33, the number of armed conflicts currently raging globally. 875 million small arms are in circulation around the world today. And perhaps the most dangerous number of all, 20,500. That's the number of nuclear heads all the nuclear powers of the world currently possess. Um, and just to put things in perspective, uh, let me give you another amusing number, $2.5 billion. $2.5 billion, compare that to this, this uh, 1,765 billion. 2.5 billion is the total United Nations annual regular budget for peace and security, humanitarian and international law put together. And compare that to this number here. So the, the reason that I uh, decided I was going to use this time here to talk about dealing with war as, an, as, as a global enterprise rather than a set of events is because I've spent my academic and professional life really dealing with, with the, the whole business of peace. And I find that researchers and, and, and policy makers in the corridors of power keep making four fatal assumptions that I'm going to talk to you about. One. War is fought in uniform. That certainly used to be the case. War was fought in battlefields by soldiers in uniform on behalf of governments against other governments. This is no longer true. War has come to us. It is increasingly being, being waged by non-state actors. And the figures show us that most casualties of armed conflict today are civilians, not soldiers. Two, war is none of my business. Well, this fits very neatly into my first assumption. If war has come to you, and you and I are not only the belligerents of war, but also the, the ones who suffer most its consequences, then clearly the solutions lie with us. War is very much our business. The third fatal assumption, war can be talked away. Now, a lot of the discourse on peace remains limited to precisely that. It is verbal discourse. War cannot be talked away. We need global, actionable plans that treat it as if it was one problem. And fourth, perhaps the most fatal assumption of them all, We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. This has been the international community's problem. When we are confronted with problems like the genocide in Rwanda, we deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. When the Centr Central African Republic is burning, we'll deal with it. There has to be the use of weapons of mass destruction in Syria, then we'll deal with it. But if you can consider problems like drugs, problems like HIV AIDS, problems like human trafficking as one big global problem, and of course, every case of trafficking, every case in all of these things is also very different and very contextual, just like armed conflict, why don't we treat armed conflict as if it was one big problem? So during my talk today, I'm going to use a very simple business model, now that we've established that war is a global enterprise, to tell you why why is it that war, despite all of, all of that it is, continues to persist as an industry in our world? Why we should put it out of business? Why there's something very, very remarkable and unique about this generation that makes us possible to do this? And lastly, what can we do to put an entire industry out of business using a very, very simple uh, economic model? So why should we put war out of business? I mean, it sounds like a very, very simple question. And I'm sure the answers are obvious. But oh, off the top of my head, let me list them out for you. People die. 
Now, this would be a little funny if it wasn't so overwhelmingly tragic that this hasn't cut it so far as an excuse for us to start looking for global actionable plans and solutions. So let me put a little bit of a business jargon into it to convince you further. War sets back, armed conflict sets back development several decades. It destroys infrastructure, it pollutes our natural resources, it distracts our resources away. Even if we are not participants in war, for example, a government that doesn't go around attacking other countries still needs to spend billions on defense because we are all part of a global system which makes us insecure, which requires us to have strong defenses in place. And I was reminded of a very amusing line I once read, and I don't know who to attribute it to. It was a piece of graffiti that said, I'd like to live in a world where schools have enough money and the Air Force has to have a bake sale to buy a jet plane. So these are just some of the reasons we should put war out of business. Um, so what is it that, that it's such a grossly dangerous and such, a, such an unsustainable industry, so why is it still alive? Investor returns. The leaders of militias, of insurgent groups, of, of uh, belligerent states, uh, hell-bent upon genocide, find that they get returns out of their investments in war. They get either economic power or political power or some space in the political spectrum, or they get territory. De the demand for war. These are the same leaders who are able to generate demand in societies. They are able to tell you and me that the people who don't look like you, who don't worship the same gods, who don't speak the same language, who live outside of a particular boundary, are your enemies. And to go to war with them is the only way we can win. And thirdly, we are. In our acquiescence, in our inaction, we are all participating in, in the, the continuous survival of this industry. So how do you drive an entire industry out of business? Now, this is the tricky question. Think of any industry, any, any product that it makes, hybrid cars, cereal. Let's, let's take toasters as an example. Um, why do we have a toaster industry? It's because, one, people want toast. Someone is making toasters. And there are no other good alternative options available which can get bread crispy enough for butter. So what, what have we established here? There's demand, there's supply, and there is the absence of alternatives. Well then, if you're going to put any industry out of business, it's really very simple if you look at the model. You need to destroy demand, you need to destroy supply, and you need to create alternatives. Before I get into exactly how it is that we go about doing these things, um, I'd like, you, I'd like to draw your attention to something quite remarkable about our entire generation. Um, we have a unique position in history. We are uniquely poised to address these global issues in a way that no other generation has ever been able to. And I'm not saying this from a point of view that every generation thinks it's standing at the high noon of history. I'm pretty sure the ones who uh, underwent the Great Depression of 1932 were slightly you know, less hopeful than us when we think of our Great Recession of 2008. But um, why, why is it that what makes us so special and unique? Let's look at these two maps here. The first one is a very interesting 3D model you can look up online, um, which gives you all of the imports and exports of small arms and ammunitions around the world. And it's, if, you, if you look at it online, it's kind of a 3D model. It keeps moving and shows you the flows. The second shows you all the flight routes of a particular major American airline. This tells you two things. Globalization for us today is an excellent thing. It helps us access everything. But two, it's also profoundly dangerous. And I'm talking here about the contagion effect of globalization. Um, if it's a war is more dangerous for us than it has ever been before. We live in a world of 20,500 nuclear warheads. But we also have that same force of globalization that can be turned around and made to work for us. It's so much more difficult for leaders to make enemies out of people when they can use democratic social media to talk to each other and have media and culture that's, that has more space for us to feature our voices on it. We also inherited a world where systems of global governance, like the United Nations, international laws and conventions to manage disarmament, are sort of already in place. All we need to do is use them so that they become stable, effective mechanisms with which to control armed conflict. So then how do you destroy the demand for war? The demand for war essentially arises from two things. Either you think that people who are naturally different from you in terms of their language or region or religion or the fact that they live in another country are your enemies. We destroy this demand by making sure we are using a global plan for intercultural dialogue and international dialogue which happens at the level of people. Conflict can no longer be resolved with diplomats sitting in a drawing room in Geneva. It needs to be resolved between you and me. And we need to use our media globally to do this for us. 
The second thing which generates the demand for war is when people who, for example, listen to militant insurgent movements or terrorist movements, uh, they feel like they have nothing to lose. That's how suicide missions happen. You need to create development programs, our official development assistance at the international level, our international financial institutions need to tie in development very closely with some very basic policies like equity, the fact that people need to feel invested in the development of their own countries. I mean, an individual should be able to look at the bridges and the factories and the schools in her city and say, these are mine. I have very high stakes in these. I can't afford for this to be destroyed by armed conflict. We can't leave anyone so far behind that they say, I have nothing to lose. So we do, and what, another way to stop us generating a demand for war is to have a global mapping system in place. Now, a lot of research is being done at universities and think tanks around the world. What we need is for multilateral governance to bring the global mapping exercise into one unified whole so that we know when something is going wrong somewhere, this could ex escalate into conflict. We need more scientific, uh, more quantitative research into the factors of conflict as if it was one problem, the same way we do with drugs or trafficking or uh, a global pandemic of any sort. So we need to have those global mapping systems in place so that we can arrest the demand for war when we see it. How do you remove the supply of war? The supply of war lies in weapons. It's particularly weapons of mass destruction. In my work with the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, I found that all it really took was a strong international norm against a weapon of mass destruction, voiced not only by states, but ordinary people who were so abhorrent about them, that within 15 years, this organization was able to bring in most countries of the world under the Chemical Weapons Convention under an international verification mechanism and make them get rid of most of their stockpiles of chemical weapons and progress on others is continuing. That is all it took. Um, we spoke about a few numbers right in the beginning. Here's another number for you. And again, I'd like you to keep in mind $1,765 billion annually on military, expen on, uh, on military expenditure. Um, $0.65 billion. $0.65 billion is the entire annual budget of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the United Nations Office on Disarmament Affairs, the CTBTO, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization, and the OPCW combined annually, 0 0.65. It shows you how little we spend, but it also shows you this is exactly how, this is, especially the OPCW shows you this is how little you need if you really, really put a global citizen's voice behind it. What are our alternatives then to the business of war? We need to strengthen, in my opinion, the international norm of the responsibility to protect. To institutionalize it in legitimate systems like the United Nations so that it is put, peacekeeping forces and humanitarian military interventions can be put into force as soon as there is an escalation of conflict in a systematic way, not on a case-by-case -case basis. In Rwanda, when we were confronted with this problem, we all wished that more peacekeeping forces had been invested then. Um, what really is this idea of the responsibility to protect? It's a simple idea that suggests to you that the sovereignty of a country is often less important than when human lives are at stake. What this essentially means is that it is typically a government's responsibility to protect its own citizens against mass atrocities and genocide and violence. But if all other options have been exhausted and the country can, is no longer in a position to protect its citizens and can't do so, it is the responsibility of the international community to act. And we have that quite profoundly in the United Nations peacekeeping system, but we need to institutionalize this more. We, we need dialogue at every level of society, of states, of people, researchers working on this, to get together a set of standards which would mandate an intervention instead of us losing lives because we were too busy talking politics. So then, ladies and gentlemen, when we have destroyed demand, we have destroyed supply, and we've created a few alternatives, will we finally begin to phase this industry of war out of business? Because genuinely, in the 21st century, it is entirely our concerns. It is my responsibility, it is your responsibility, because war has finally come to us. And as I close, I leave you with a little bit of wisdom that comes, um, it might seem like it's come from an unlikely pace, place, but I often feel like astronomers know something about our world that political scientists and policy makers so often miss. It was um, Carl Sagan, uh, some of you might already be familiar with this, who looked at 
you can barely even see it. There's a shaft of light, and right in the middle of this, there's a tiny little dot, which is supposed to be the Earth. And this picture was taken by the space probe Voyager 1. He looked at this, and it, it told him something about how irrelevant our boundaries were, and how much more we could talk to each other in, instead of investing all of our time in uh, fighting so we could become momentary masters of a fraction of a dot, is what he said. And he looked at that dot and said, on it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident ideologies and religion, confident, uh, religions, ideologies and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we have spent far too long and far too many generations and far too many of our resources trying to make peace. I genuinely think that it's now time to declare war on war. Thank you.